UConn to the Big 12, it may happen, but there's a lot of work to be done. You are Locked On College Basketball, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, what's up? Welcome into the Locked On College Basketball Podcast, the only daily national college hoop show out there. I'm your host, Isaac Shade, and you're joining me at The Place to get your college basketball content every single day. It's all part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Very seriously, I want to thank you for making us your first listen or watch of the day. And I want to remind you that you can get every episode ad-free on Amazon Music. Special shout out to all the everydayers joining us and all the members of the Locked On College Basketball Discord. Welcome in, everybody. Glad you're here. Let's get after it. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Now, through September 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. Coming up on the show today, we're going to continue the conversation that Andy and I started yesterday about the potential of UConn to the Big 12. Again, <laughs> it sounds like last offseason all over again. We're going to look at Tennessee's schedule. We have the entire schedule, non-con and conference schedule. Thanks, SEC. We appreciate you. And the Players Era Festival, that new NIL MTE that's going on this Thanksgiving. It's in maybe some hot water with the NCAA. We're going to unpack all of that coming up. Let's start right on in with the latest and greatest on the UConn Big 12 potential marriage. We'll talk about it. So yesterday, Andy and I reopened this whole can of worms that, that came up last uh, offseason around this same time. Last year, it was, you know, opposite uh, coasts because we had some Gonzaga talk. We had some UConn talk. As we know, neither of those things went through. And here we go. We're talking about UConn. Again, there's no Gonzaga in the mix this time. So basically the plan, if you missed it yesterday or haven't heard anything, would be for UConn to join the Big 12 in everything but football by 2026 and then football in by 2031 um, and would have to, the university, hit several uh, financial thresholds by that point. 2031, oh, by the way, coincides with certain uh, media rights agreements that wrap up at that point. So on Monday, CBS's Dennis Dodd, who is a does a fantastic job, I always appreciate his work, um, had an article that came out on cbssports.com early evening on Monday detailing the newest updates from Monday because there was more that was going to happen on Monday. And honestly, folks, I'm just saying, I think this is going to be a major storyline for us to watch kind of going throughout this week, maybe the next couple of weeks. We'll just have to keep our eyes on it because the important beats to know are these. Two weeks ago, UConn made a presentation to Big 12 officials. That presentation was then shared with Big, uh, with Big 12 presidents and CEOs on Monday, yesterday. And the reason I say this is probably going to go on for a while is because because of a lack of unanimity, there was no voting, no thing of any kind on Monday. Um, the Big 12 presidents, they were briefed on the possibility of it. And from the um, the reporting, the, the researching, the behind the scenes work that Dennis Dodd and CBS did, their best understanding is that if a vote had been taken on Monday, Six schools would have been in favor of adding UConn. Two would have been against it. And then the other eight we don't know about right now. Remember, there are 16 teams now in the Big 12. And so of those 16, six are in favor as of right now. Two are against it. The other eight we don't know. Here's the deal. In order for this to pass, it needs to be by supermajority, meaning that 12 of the 16 Big 12 schools, current Big 12 schools, would have to uh, say yes, would have to approve of the UConn ad, meaning that only four could say no. Well, if two of those are no's right now, we'll get to that math in just a second. Another part of this whole conversation is obviously the media rights associated with it. 
right now, the, the media deal for the Big 12 is kind of a joint thing between Fox and ESPN. This also, by the way, verified by Dodd and CBS in their reporting. Fox is, to their best knowledge and understanding from doing their, their behind-the-scenes work, Fox would be against the ad. ESPN, on the other hand, would be for it. I'll break down why I believe that is in just a second. Um, and then obviously on the basketball side of these things, uh, of this conversation, which again, Commissioner Brett Gormark wants this to not just be a football conversation. He wants it to be about basketball too. Obviously a UConn ad is a huge value ad in basketball. Football, at least right now in 2024, not so much. Who knows what happens over the course of the next seven years, but as of right now, a adding UConn in football would certainly serve to damage the, the strength of schedule of the big 12, especially by the way, remember who they just lost Texas and Oklahoma. UConn ain't doing anything to fill in that gap. Am I right? So let's unpack all of this. Nothing right now is imminent despite what others have, have said or reported. There's nothing to do right now. In fact, I think it's less imminent than several are trying to tell you that it is. Part of that is because there are clearly schools that are not on board with this. We don't know about the other eight yet. But remember, some quick math tells you that if 12 of the 16 schools have to say yes for this to happen, and two of them are currently out, if three of the final eight say no, this is dead on arrival. It's not going to happen. At least right now, we can always strike up the band again next summer. Let's get the group back together, right? And But but that's where it's at right now. Now, when you think about the Fox and ESPN of it all, of course Fox is against it. Why? Let me tell you. Fox just signed a new contract this summer, like two months ago, with Big East. What happens when UConn leaves the Big East? the back-to-back de -back defending national champion in basketball, it severely devalues that entity that Fox just signed. So, of course, they don't want uh, that to happen. I know it would be going from one of their entities to another of their entities, but the second ent the entity that UConn would be going to is already in great shape, right? The Big 12 can lose a Texas and a Oklahoma and still be in good shape. The Big East cannot lose UConn. I mean, yes, I know Marquette's doing well. I know Creighton's doing well. Vanilla, vanilla, Villanova's up and down. UConn is, is the big dog right now in the Big East. And so, of course, Fox is like, no. Also, that would mean not only losing UConn from their Big East new agreement, but it would mean having to get it all figured out with updating their Big 12 contract along with their partner ESPN, which currently runs through the end of, I hinted at this earlier, 2031. That's right. So hence um, why right now the, the thought is adding UConn in all sports other than football by 26 and then waiting on football until 31. So of course Fox is against it, but of course also ESPN does want it. You know why? Because ESPN is not in on that Big East deal. So that means let's follow the logical thing here. ESPN doesn't have Big East right now. That means no Big East means no UConn. No UConn means they don't have the two-time defending national champion on their airwaves. You know what's a good thing for ESPN? To have UConn on their airwaves. And so, yeah, they're going to welcome this. And so that, to me, is one of the more interesting storylines to watch in this whole thing is the Fox and ESPN interplay. It's not even just about the schools. It's how are the media rights agreements playing into all of this. Also, and oh, by the way, regardless of any of this, if I was an AD right now, if I was a school president, chancellor, whatever it is, I would absolutely vote no on this thing right now. I would not want to be moving anything. You know why? Because we're just right now waiting on this little thing that we call House versus NCAA. And until we know more about that settlement and what it's going to mean in terms of how much money we're having to pay out and do all those things, then I don't want to do anything because you look at the Big Ten and the SEC money right now, they'll be fine. They'll be able to handle this $23 million they got to pay out or whatever it is annually. Big 12 schools, I don't know that all of them are in position right now to be able to handle that. And would UConn be? 
it seems like that might be in question. So all of that to say, just like Andy and I said yesterday, the same is true today after the presentation from the Big 12 to the uh, Big 12 presidents. Um, it's not go time yet, and so we're going to have to keep waiting. Will will it result in UConn making a change? Can't say that with any certainty one way or the other right now, but I can tell you that this is where we're at. Now, thanks to the SEC going ahead and releasing their conference schedule last week and the Vols also releasing releasing their non-conference schedule, we have the entire lineup for Rick Barnes' teams. And I got to tell you, this non-con schedule is looking pretty solid. I'll unpack it for you coming up in just a sec. Right after I tell you about five-hour energy, look, just about every day after lunch, man, I, I'm i like, uh, it just hits me, man. I feel tired. It's that afternoon lull that just gets you. And if you're like me, good news. You're not alone. In fact, research shows that more than 70% of us hit that wall right after lunch. So why not let a five-hour energy shot help you leap over that wall instead of crashing into it like I usually do? Another thing is that I've been working on cutting out sugar out of my diet because I'm getting old. I'm 40. I'm, I'm seeing it, man. There's gray in my beard. And so I love that 5-Hour Energy has zero sugar in it. Plus, though, it on the plus side, it's got a convenient portable size. And it's that perfect pick-me-up for getting stuff done, particularly in the afternoon. The 5-Hour Energy website has flavors galore. You got watermelon, tropical burst, grape, berry, and more. Go try them all. And on the site, you even have the option to build your own 12-pack or 24-pack. You choose the flavors, and it's delivered right to your door. Just go to 5hourenergy.com. That's the number five, not spelled out, and get some 5-Hour Energy product today. You can use my promo code LOCKEDONCFB to receive 20% off your order. This offer is only valid until September 30th, and one order on one order, excuse me, and cannot be used with other promotions, and the code is no good on subscription orders. So go to 5hourenergy.com today. Rick Barnes in Tennessee just enjoyed one of the best seasons in all of program history, thanks to that defense that's always there, but most importantly, some dude by the name of Dalton Connect that transferred in from UNC. No, not the Tar Heels University of Northern Colorado. He's now gone and off playing for the Lakers. And so the question is, what is Tennessee going to do as a follow-up? Well, for those of you watching on YouTube, I have Tennessee's non-conference schedule pulled up so that you can see it. We can talk about it and interact with it. For those of you listening, don't you worry. Don't you fret. I'm going to read this bad boy off to you. So SEC, remember, is the lone major conference still playing 18 conference games, meaning that this non-conference schedule is 13 games. So let's hit it. On opening day of college basketball, Monday, November 4th, when almost everybody in Division I is playing, Tennessee will host Gardner-Webb. And here we go. Right out of the gate, we are not waiting on this thing. That very next game, that coming Saturday, November 9th, Tennessee travels to Louisville. Yum! That's going to be a fun matchup for that first weekend for us. Uh, sorry about your college football, but I got some appointment college basketball viewing to do. Then uh, a couple of bye games back at home Wednesday, November 13th against Montana, Sunday, November 17th against in state's Austin P. And then we move to uh, later that week, the week before Thanksgiving, Thursday, November 21st, Friday, November 22nd. Tennessee will be down in the Bahamas for the Baja Mar Bahamas. We, as of yet, don't have the matchups for that, but it's a four team MTE. Along with Tennessee is Baylor, St. John's, and Virginia. So we'll get uh, two games on Thursday. The winners and losers will face off on Friday. And then Tennessee will come home for Thanksgiving week, face UT Martin back at, uh, back there in Knoxville on Thanksgiving Eve, Wednesday, November 27th. Tuesday, And then a little bit of a break, Tuesday, December 3rd, against Syracuse in the SEC-ACC Challenge. Another break, essentially, that's probably going to be finals week there for the Vols. Tuesday, December 10th against Miami up at MSG, the Jimmy V Classic in New York City. And then after that, Saturday, December 14th at Illinois. And so, yes, you heard me correct. That is two true road games against power conference teams. Rick Barnes, I love you. 
And then wrapping up the non-conference schedule with three bye games back at home. Tuesday, December 17th against Western Carolina. Monday, December 23rd against Middle Tennessee State out of Murfreesboro there. And then Tuesday, December 31st, New Year's Eve against Norfolk State before moving into SEC play on Saturday, January 4th at home against John Calipari Jonas. Hey, dude, is coming back to Knoxville, baby. So here are my takes for this thing. I, I just mentioned it, but the biggest thing that I love right out of the gate is that Rick Barnes is taking his team on the road for two true non-con games or two true road games in the non-conference schedule against high major opponents at Louisville and at Illinois. So it's not even just some random high major, you know, it's not like, well, sure, it's a Big East team, but it's DePaul. And sure, it's an ACC team, but it's Cal or something like that. I mean, this is Louisville and Illinois. Louisville's going to be better this year. Illinois is probably going to take a little bit of a step back, but they're still going to be really good. So this Louisville series was announced June 6th of this summer at Louisville this year, November 9th, as we talked about. And then next year back in Knoxville, we already have the date for that one, actually December 16th. The Illinois series started last year in Knoxville. Vols won, Vols won that one, 86-79, back on December 9th. Here's the my only pushback on this thing is Coach Barnes. You didn't line this thing up great, man. Most teams that we're seeing do this will have two of these home and homes going on at once, but it's inverted to where you get one at home and one on the road. Tennessee, man, they're traveling for both of them right now. So, you know, like kudos to you. Way to go. But you didn't line this one up, right? So we'll see what goes on with that. And uh, But, yeah, Louisville and Illinois on the road. Kudos. Love it. Um, another thing, just before that Illinois game, Tennessee is playing three straight high major opponents. Um, it'll be Syracuse in the SEC ACC Challenge, then Miami and then Illinois. And that is all part of a stretch of what I think is the most difficult part. I don't know if the entire schedule, because I got a couple um, SEC stretches that are going to be tough. But over the course of 24 days, from Thursday, November 21st, through Saturday, December 14th, five games against high major opponents out of the six games they'll play in that stretch. That starts with the Baja Mar, where it'll eat be two of three of Baylor, St. John's, and Virginia, right? Whatever that those two teams are, that's going to be high majors. Um, and then you get UT Martin, that's the one break. And then that Syracuse, Miami, Illinois that we just talked about. So that's five high major teams in the non-conference schedule in six days. And that's solid. I love it. I, I'm really excited for that. And whatever combination we get for Baja Mar, those are three teams that have something to say. I mean, if you play Baylor and then Virginia, man, that's that's back-to-back -back games against teams that are very, very different stylistically. So that, that in itself is tough. The makeup of this schedule, 13 games, eight of them are at home, uh, two true road games, and then three neutral sites, the Jimmy V Classic and the two Baja Mar games. My prediction for this schedule is 11-2 and two for Tennessee heading into SEC play. The SEC doesn't have any games mixed in here. They are all um, January 4th and on over the course of a 10-week schedule. So again, I've got it at 11-2. I think Tennessee will win the game at Louisville, but I have them dropping the game at Illinois. And then one other game, either one of the Baja Mar games or Syracuse or Miami. Um, and so 11-2, and two, man, that's a great, great record and one that you want to be taking into SEC play. As for SEC play, I don't want to spend much time on that right now. Um, but I do want to say this. There are two stretches in the SEC schedule that I think are the toughest. And interestingly, one of them is the very first three games of the SEC schedule. And both of these, by the way, happen over the course of eight days. Saturday, January 4th. Welcome to the new year. Your host in Arkansas, as I alluded to. Then either that Tuesday or Wednesday, we don't have the specifics on that date. But all SEC games are Saturdays and Tuesdays or Wednesdays, so you can take that to the bank. January 7th or 8th at Florida, so just a couple days later after hosting Arkansas, go to Florida, come back home, and then that Saturday you go straight to Austin, Texas to play Texas. So over the course of eight days, at home against Arkansas, at Florida, at Texas. That's going to be a tough 
stretch there for Tennessee. The other toughest stretch starts actually, coincidentally enough, on my birthday, Saturday, January 25th. My birthday is on a Saturday this year. That's fun. At Auburn, that Tuesday, that one we do have specified to is Tuesday, January 28th, hosting Kentucky, and then that Saturday, February 1st, hosting Florida. So one of the differences is two of those games in that second three games slate are at home. But I think that the teams are tougher, Auburn, Kentucky, Florida, versus the other that's Arkansas, Florida, Texas, with the Florida and Texas games on the road. So I think that those are the two toughest three-game stretches of the SEC schedule for Tennessee. Really, really curious to see how this all comes together. I think it could be another strong year for Tennessee, but we got to see it. Okay, speaking of multi-team events like the Baja Mar Bahamas Classic, surprise, surprise to some of us, the Players' Era Festival might just be going against NCAA regulations. Oh boy, we never could have seen that coming, right? Oh, of course we did. <laughs> we'll talk about all that coming up in just a second. But first, I want to take a moment to fill in you guys, the great community of Locked On College Basketball. I want to give you a heads up about a brand new mobile game that I think you're really going to enjoy and that you should check out. It's called The Ultimate College Football Head Coach. This is an amazing simulation where you get to step into the shoes of a head coach and lead your college football program to glory. Can you imagine actually stepping into the shoes of your favorite football team's head coach and doing the job? Well, from recruiting players to hiring coaching staff to dealing with scholarship stuff, uh, overseeing training camps and more, you control every crucial detail of your program. You think you can handle that pressure? Well, here's what I really love about the game. You're responsible for calling offensive plays, so your strategy will not only determine the success of your season, but will shape the future and legacy of your program. Ultimate College Football Head Coach is completely free, has no ads, and is 100% playable offline. You can play on the go whenever and however you want. And of course, you know that I've got a special offer for all of you, the Locked On College Basketball family. Use promo code LOCKEDONCFB, all caps, inside the game store to receive a free boost for your program. To download the game, just visit ultimate-cfb.com or look it up on the app stores. Ultimate College Football Head Coach. Begin your coaching legacy today. Been holding on to this one for just a little bit. This is actually um, something that Andy and I had thought about talking about last week, but it kept getting pushed back. So I want to make sure to get it in today before it becomes fully and completely old news uh, from something that came out a week ago. The Players Era Festival, which many of you might not know that name of it, but might recognize it by just the generic, it's the NIL multi-team event that's coming up this November in Las Vegas during Thanksgiving week. It'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, take off Thanksgiving Day and wrap up on Friday. You know, there's all this it, that we've talked about with it. You know, Andy and I said, for example, as it came out, oh man, there's this NIL MTE where they're paying everybody and uh, millions of dollars going out and all the other MTEs are going to have to figure out how to compete with this. And I still think that's a reality. However, Sportico wrote a great article detailing some interesting information um, because they were able to get their hands on an NCAA memo that went out basically calling into question the players era festival. Let me just read you the first couple lines right out of the gate from this Sportico article. Quote, the NCAA on Tuesday, and again, this is last Tuesday, August 20th, circulated a memo about its rules regarding men's basketball multi-team events that appear to implicitly address, if not cast doubt upon, the new Players Era Festival in Las Vegas, which has agreed to pay $1 million to each of the NIL collectives of its eight participating teams. What's interesting to me about this is a lot. I mean, that right there is incisive. I mean, it just is like biting, man. It'll get you right out of the thing. And keep in mind, as we sit here on Tuesday, August 27th, this event will literally be taking place three months to the day. That'll be day two is um, August 20, or excuse me, November 27th. And yet to this point, we haven't heard about the sponsors of this event. 
we still don't know. I mean, kind of from the get-go of the reporting on this, I remember, I feel like it was Matt Norlander from CBS who I first remember bringing out the information about that and saying, hey, pretty soon here we expect uh, to hear more about who the streaming partner is going to be. This won't be over broadcast TV, but there will be a streaming partner. We still don't know who that's going to be. So not only are, are there some interesting things on the NCAA side, but it's like, not all the details for this thing seem to be coming together yet. And to me, that's beginning to get a, like we're close enough now. There's some things that are starting to get suspect for me. Well, here's more about what the NCAA reiterated to the tournament operators and schedulers. Because Sportico actually obtained a two-page FAQ sheet that was part of this. So, quote, the NCAA reiterated that its bylaws make it impermissible for athletes to receive NIL money in exchange for participating in an MTE. You hearing that? Even if that money is routed first through a collective. Ever wondered the group that's part of bringing this together, which previously had said it's been working with the NCAA, has sought to distinguish the money it is paying to collectives as being tied to athlete, quote, NIL opportunities with, quote, sponsors outside of competition. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds like a lot of verbal gymnastics to try to figure out how we can get around the NCAA's rules and regulations without being forthright and upfront and doing this thing properly. So that doesn't seem like it's going to fly. But at the same time, on the other hand, has the NCAA ever proven itself capable of saying, okay, no, we're shutting this whole thing down? Um, I don't know that it has. And so it's like, on one hand, I see what's trying to happen with the Players' Era Festival here. But on the other, I wouldn't be surprised if they just keep trying to call the NCAA's bluff. Like, go ahead and shut us down. What are you going to do? Here's where this just continues to the, oh man, so this is more from the article. Quote, according to portions of its talent provider and management, Agreements reviewed by Sportico, Everwonder has agreed to three-year deals, right? The, a lot of these teams have committed to three-year, um, being part of uh, the Players' Era Festival for three years. Three-year deals that commit the studio and its unnamed partners to paying $3 million through 2026. Furthermore, the agreements stipulate that Everwonder is supposed to transfer the money to the collectives within 15 days of the event taking place. If Everwonder determines that it is unable to operate any or all of the 2024 event, 2025 event, or 2026 event, it can pay each collective a termination fee of $250,000. So wait a second. We're we're having conversations that they might not be able to operate, you know, and I know at some level, this is just like covering their bases, but the fact that this is even a consideration, and I know it's got to be part of the contract to, to take care of stuff, but holy smokes. And even if that has to happen, a termination fee of a quarter million dollars, that adds up. I mean, you think about these eight teams that are going to be part of it this year, that's $2 million right there. You got that? That's still a lot of money. The agreements further state that participating athletes, and man, this the, the language and the verbiage of this is just icky to me. The agreements further state that participating athletes will be requested, requested to participate in marketing, sponsorship, endorsements, and other promotional activities, and to make public appearances. These specific NIL activities will be later specified. So in this, there's no mandating of participation. There's no, you have to do this. They're going to be paid, but they're just going to be requested to participate. And those specific NIL activities haven't been enumerated. We're going to specify them later. How on earth are they getting away with this? What? Here's more. The collective agreements are separate from the event participation, excuse me, let me re restart that. The collective agreements are separate from the event participation agreements between Everwonder and the schools, which make no reference to the NIL money. What? I just, I do not see now how this is going to fly. I have completely flipped and I, I just don't see it. And keep in mind, the NCAA, beyond all of that with the financial and NIL side of this, that is, in my opinion, now seriously called into question, 
there's the whole, how are we getting around multiple teams from the same conference in this thing? Because, quote, another issue highlighted in, t- in Tuesday's NCAA memo is whether the tournament format of Players Era Festival will fly. The festival purports to be composed of two distinct four-team MTEs. Remember, there's the Impact MTE and the Power MTE. This latest structure would seem, seem, keyword, to address the NCAA's prohibition of two teams from the same conference simultaneously participating in the same MTE. Because this year it's got both A&M, Texas A&M and Alabama, SEC schools, and Oregon and Rutgers, Big Ten schools. Still, the NCAA's memo suggests that the event would require some, you ready for this, interpretive generosity or a thick veil of ignorance to pass muster. I mean, this is beautifully written. Even if the MTE is structured in such a way in which two teams from the same conference will not play each other, two teams from the same conference may not participate in the same MTE, the NCAA writes. So... Even if you can get past the NIL side of it with all the, again, what I'm calling verbal gymnastics to make that work, how do you get around this? I just financially and under the NCAA's regulations, I don't see how this flies, whether it's this year or years beyond. So on one hand, as Andy and I have talked about, this seems like the new thing that this NIL backed MTEs are going to be something that everyone else has to figure out. But on the other hand, yikes, I don't know that this is. I don't know if it's going to fly and how it's going to fly. I just, the whole thing now is suspect to me. I'm curious your thoughts on it. So anyway, wow, what a thing. Thank you to Sportico for diving into this and bringing it all to light. So we'll continue to keep tabs on Players Era Festival, both for this year and its viability for seasons beyond as well. That's it for today's episode. Thanks so much for joining me here on Locked On College Basketball. If you haven't subscribed on video and audio, make sure you do that so you don't miss a second of the show. If you're not part of the Locked On College Basketball Discord community, we would love to have you there. The link is in the show notes and it's absolutely free to join. Come on in. As always, I want to say apologies to the lawyer family. Let's go Wildcats. And until tomorrow when Andy Patton's back with you. Peace.